happy today to introduce Janice Kaplan, <clears throat> who is the author of Genius Women. When I read Janice's book, I was so excited that I actually contacted Janice on LinkedIn and invited her to be with us because she has written such an important book about the history of women in fields like composing, music, art, physics, a number of fields where decades ago, they weren't even acknowledged or allowed to publish work just because they were females. And while many of us knew that women struggled, of course, for decades to receive equality, the, the stories in Genius Women are stories that every person should read. And Janice writes so beautifully that you're completely captivated by every story. And yet she's giving us a, a historical narrative about women and it will hopefully inspire each of you as it inspired me to do more and understand that any kind of discrimination means that we all lose the possibility of, of greatness and invention and innovation and art and beauty because people were denied just because they happened to be the gender that society didn't approve of or the color of their skin people thought wasn't acceptable. When you think about it logically, it's totally absurd. And yet that bias is so destructive. So we have an opportunity, the more we recognize that, to change it. And Janice, we are all looking forward to your comments. So welcome. Thank you. Um, it is a joy to get to be here. Uh, thank you so much. And, you know, I suspect that if I were writing this book now, I would probably be including you in it, Carolyn, and uh, maybe oh. so many of the other people who are, are sharing, uh, sharing in this wonderful summit. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, I will uh, uh, share my screen now, if that is okay, and get started. Absolutely. Okay. Um, give me one moment to, to do this. Uh, how does that look? Looks Can you great. That correctly? Hmm? Great. Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, my book is, as Carolyn just so nicely said, The Genius of Women. And this is actually, gosh, I think it's about my 14th book. Um, but writing this book was a joy because, first of all, I got to meet so many extraordinary people um, and because it's a subject that is so dear to my heart and that I got to learn so much um, as I was writing the book. Um, I was inspired to write this book after a friend of mine, a pollster named Mike Berland, uh, did a survey where he found that 90% of, of people say that geniuses tend to be men. 90% is a crazy number. You don't get 90% of people to say that they like chocolate ice cream. And when asked to name a female genius, virtually the only person anybody could come up with was Marie Curie. So Mike invited me out to lunch one day and he told me the results of this survey. And he said to me, what do you think is going on? Why do you think that would be? And I just truly didn't have an answer for him. But basically Mike paid for lunch and I spent the next two years uh, trying to come up with that answer for him. Um, I started my research in London. Uh, actually, there are a lot of smart people in London and at Oxford and um, I came across a professor named Charles Jones. And we also had lunch. You get a lot of good lunches when you are uh, a writer. And actually, our, we were supposed to be talking about his work. And instead, we ended up talking about mine. And when I told him that I was writing about genius, he sort of looked at me. And in his very plumy English accent, which I won't try to capture, he said, genius that would be where extraordinary ability meets celebrity. Now, I was really 
taken aback by this comment because, as I said, he is a Cambridge professor. He's an academic. He did not mean celebrity in any Kardashian sort of way. But what he meant is that a lot of people do great work, but not all of that great work gets recognized. And probably that's something that a lot of you realize too. Um, whether you're in academics, whether you're in a corporation, whether you're in the arts, a lot of people do great work. And the difference sometimes as to who we actually call a genius versus who we don't know is simply whether they have had the ability to get their work recognized. And for so much of history, women have really had only half of that equation. They've had the extraordinary talent and they haven't had the celebrity. They haven't had the recognition, the ability to get their work noticed. Let me give you an example of that. Um, somebody who many of you may know or have heard of, a woman named Lise Meitner. And back in the 1930s, Lise Meitner was absolutely one of the key people in the discovery of nuclear fission. Now, nuclear fission is kind of a big deal, right? It is what has led to uh, nuclear energy, uh, nuclear power plants, and unfortunately, nuclear weapons, though Lise Meitner refused to have anything to do with that. She was really the first person who understood what happens when you, when you break the, the, the atomic nucleus of uranium. She explained it in a way that nobody else had before. Needless to say, this won the Nobel Prize. I say this one because Lise Meitner did not win the Nobel Prize. It went to her lab partner, a man named Otto Hahn. Now, from what I've read, Otto Hahn was a very good chemist and actually a very nice man. And maybe he even deserved to win a Nobel Prize for something else, but not for the discovery of nuclear fission because he didn't really understand exactly what it was in the same way that Lise Meitner did. But somebody else who didn't understand something was the Nobel Prize Committee. And what they didn't understand was that a woman could actually have made a discovery like this. They just couldn't get their heads around that idea. And so their default was to give it to the man. Some years later, many years later, the proceedings of the Nobel Committee were opened up. Uh, great physicists looked at the proceedings and they said that not recognizing Lee's Meitner was one of the most egregious oversights they had ever seen. And now trust me, in the contest for egregious oversights, there is a lot of competition. So what was going on here? Well, we could label it as simple misogyny. And believe me, I do not rule that out. But I think it's something a little bit subtler, which is what psychologists refer to as confirmation bias, which means that when we already have a belief about something, and the belief, as you can see in this picture of great physicists, which is all men except Marie Curie, when you have a belief about something, you tend to look for all of the information that's going to support it. A simple example outside of gender, if you buy a new car, um, you've done the research, then you buy your new car, and then you start to see all of the articles that say that your car is the safest and the best. And if you happen to see an article that says that yours is not very good, you discard it pretty much sure that it's incorrect or you find a reason why it's incorrect. Well, we do the same thing with gender. Um, we start to have stereotypes of what men can do and what women can do, and then we start to look for that. And by the way, I think we have replaced the old stereotypes, maybe the stereotypes that existed in Lise Meitner's time with a new stereotype, which perhaps is just as dangerous. Uh, the new stereotype is that women are collegial and cooperative and men are leaders. Is that true? Well, we all know women who are collegial and cooperative. We also all know women who are leaders. We all know men who are leaders and we know men who are collegial and cooperative. But once we start looking for it, once we start expecting people to behave in a certain way, it's what we start to see over and over again. Okay, so we understand confirmation bias, but here we are at a meeting of women in technology. We are above that, right? We don't fall into these problems. We don't fall into these stereotypes. 
I wrote a book on the genius of women, I would assume that I don't fall into these problems and stereotypes. So let me tell you a story about myself. Uh, one of the early people that I interviewed as I was doing this book was Joe Dunkley who is a tenured physics professor at Princeton. She's a young professor. She had been hired away from Oxford, uh, where she was also a tenured professor of physics. And because I am not a physicist, I'm a writer and a journalist, I really prepared hard uh, for this interview. I read a lot of her research. I read about her. I knew she had won rafts of awards. I tried to understand what she had been studying. I went down to Princeton. I knocked on her door. And this lovely young woman who you see here on your screen answered the door uh, of her office and she said, oh, welcome, come in, may I offer you some tea? Now, maybe when I said to you, uh, all women in technology, that I was interviewing a tenured professor at Princeton of physics, that is exactly the person who you had in your mind. If so, I salute you because I was surprised and I realized that somewhere in the back of my head, I expected that I was going to see Albert Einstein. I think the sense that we all have very deep that geniuses look like Albert Einstein or maybe Sherlock Holmes is what has stopped us from seeing women as they are and what they do. We, we let that expectation of what a genius should be interfere. This sense of geniuses being like Albert Einstein or Sherlock Holmes starts very, very young. I was fascinated by a piece of research that was done by another professor at Princeton, whose name is Sarah Jane Leslie. And uh, she worked with a professor at NYU named Andre Simpian. And they invited small children into their lab. And they told them a story about somebody who was very, very smart. And then they showed them four pictures. Two of the pictures were of women and two of the pictures were of men. Up until the age of five, all of the children picked the person who looked most like them. The girls picked one of the women and the boys picked one of the men. At age six, it changed. And the boys picked one of the men as being the very, very smart person. And the girls picked one of the men also. And um, Leslie said that she's not sure exactly why it changes at age six, other than perhaps the messages that we are receiving become more and more potent at that age. And children take in everything, everything that's around them. Now, one of the problems I often have with social science research is that it can't be replicated. And you, know, you all know about some of the problems that have existed with some of that. The good and bad news about this study is that it has been replicated over and over again. And if you have small children, you can probably try it in your own living room uh, this afternoon. The problem with those expectations is that it stops women from being what they can be and getting the credit that they can. If you don't mind, I wanna share with you a story outside of the sciences from music. Um, a woman named Fanny Mendelssohn, who was the brother of, the, excuse me, the sister of the great composer, Felix Mendelssohn. Um, they were siblings and they started out studying together and touring together and playing their music together. Many people said that Fanny was better than Felix, and she did one performance when she was about 12 years old that was said to be absolutely extraordinary. But when she was 14 years old, her father Abraham wrote her a letter, and he said it was time for her to go home, learn needlework, do some housework, and prepare to get married. And he said that music could always be the career for Felix, but for her, it could only be a hobby and never the soul of her being. Every time I read that letter, it breaks my heart because music was the soul of her being. And what do you do? If you were a man, you say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Why can't I have both? Well, Fanny did go home, but she did what women throughout history have had to do in many different ways in many different generations. And she did the great workaround which is that she continued playing her music, um, but she did it in her own home in what she called salons. She was a very wealthy woman, so she would invite a couple of hundred people to her living room and she would have concerts for them. But because it wasn't in a 
public concert hall, it was considered okay. And even more important, she continued composing. And get this, she published her music under Felix's name. She published many, many great songs under Felix's name. Felix said that he was doing her a big favor because he was keeping her from the scandal that would accompany an upper-class woman actually being known as a composer. I say, beware of people who say they are protecting you. Beware of men who say they are protecting you. Felix got a really good deal out of it. He was invited to Buckingham Palace once and Queen Victoria said she was having him there because she loved one of the songs he had written. It was her very favorite. What could the man say? He knew Fanny had written it. When I was a little girl, a long time ago, I went to the doctor once with my mom and the doctor told my mom he thought that I was reading too much. And my mom got worried and she said, oh, is there something wrong with her eyes? And the doctor said, no, 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 the eyes are fine, but a girl can be too smart for her own good. Too smart for her own good. My mom seemed to know exactly what he was talking about, but I was baffled by it. Up until then, I thought reading and being smart were really good things and the things that made me stand out. And I continue to think that, and I continue to think it to this moment. But that phrase is one that stayed in the back of my head for a very long time, obviously up until this moment. I think that perhaps we are at the point where we would never say that directly to girls anymore. But we say it to them in a thousand different ways. We continue sending that message in so many different ways. For example, on Halloween, we dress little boys up as NASA astronauts, and we dress little girls up as Ariel from The Little Mermaid. You remember Ariel, didn't you? Many of you probably grew up with Ariel, had her back, Ariel backpacks and Ariel dolls. Well, if you've forgotten, let me tell you the story, the Disney story of that huge, best, huge hit movie is that Ariel needs to win the love of Prince Eric in order to live on land. And in order to win his love, she has to give up her voice and be mute. She can't sing, she can't speak. What better way do we have of telling little girls to shut up and be pretty? Now, I don't think parents who are putting little girls in their Ariel costumes think that they're sending them that message. And they certainly don't mean to send them that message. And I've actually seen little girls wearing their girl power t-shirts under their Ariel costumes. But guess what? Those little girls are picking up that message. And that's what we have to be really careful about. One of the women I interviewed for the Genius of Women was Cynthia Brazil, who is a roboticist at the MIT Media Lab. And she created actually the first social robot. She's a wonderful woman and uh, fascinating and exciting. And she told me that she has a couple of teenage sons and she watches her sons with their uh, friends, male and female. And she realizes that we live in an age of a thousand nudges. That, as I said, we don't tell little girls anymore that uh, they can be too smart for their own good. But maybe if they don't do really well in math class, we say, don't worry about it, honey. You're so good in drama. If boys come home and they haven't done well in math class, we get them a tutor. Now, all of you have managed to do really well in math class and to ignore those nudges that you no doubt weren't aware of um, as, you were, as you were growing up. And I do urge you to try to recognize some of those nudges that continue to happen, that continue to undermine your own sense of what you can do and who you can become. I think sometimes that subtle sexism, those subtle, com those subtle uh, words that are just in the society, in the social milieu, are almost harder to battle than the outright sexism. Because you think that maybe you're wrong, you think that maybe you misheard, but you didn't. Watch out for those nudges. Our expectations of what girls and boys can do starts at a very, very early age. Another study that I like a lot, um, researchers invited parents to bring their 11 month old babies into the lab. And they asked them to set up a ramp that would be as steep as the little baby could crawl down. So the parents went about doing this and they set up their ramps. 
And the parents of the girls set up the ramps so that they were considerably less steep than the parents of the boys. Now, the researchers, of course, tested the children afterwards and said there was absolutely no reason whatsoever for that. At age 11 months, boys and girls can do exactly the same things. If they didn't have those little ribbons in their hair, you would not know who are the boys and who are the girls. Um, and when told about it, the parents said, no way, no, 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 I'm raising children without, without uh, attention to gender and I'm raising my girls just the way I am raising the boys. But the evidence was there. The ramps for the girls were considerably less steep than the ramps for the boys. In fact, the parents of the girls way underestimated what the girls could do, and the parents of the boys way overestimated. They made the ramps too steep. But when you come right down to it, which is better, to have high expectations or to have low expectations? And I think if we can find a way to have higher expectations for our girls and maybe be a little bit more realistic about our boys, we'll go a long way. Whenever I talk about the genius of women, the question invariably comes up, the big elephant in the room, what about male and female brains? Aren't they different? Well, I'll give you the short answer right now. No, no, they're not. Um, we often hear about how people are hardwired. I spoke to many neuroscientists who told me that we are not hardwired for anything above the brainstem. The brainstem, of course, controls our most basic instincts. When a baby is born, it has billions of neurons in its brain that are unconnected. The synapses and neural pathways are not even there yet. They get connected by social activity, by what the child learns in the first year. It often amazes me that we only use the phrase hardwired to talk about things that are gender connected. And I guess for some reason it, it just makes sense with gender, but let me point out how ridiculous it is by giving you another example. By age, you know, 12 months, 18 months, children are starting to talk. Some of those children speak in Spanish, some speak in French, some speak in English, some speak in Chinese. Now that's very early on to be able to speak those different languages. So wouldn't it seem that speaking Chinese or English or French must be hardwired? If I tell you that you're going to just laugh at me and you're gonna say, come on Janice, of course not. Children are just learning the language from what they hear around them. Well, yes, I agree with you. But learning a language, picking out those specific words from all the sounds that are around you is a lot harder than picking out the image of whether you're supposed to be wearing a pink tutu or an astronaut costume. Children are picking up the social messages at a very, very early age. Some other neuroscience research has supported that. Um, Daphne Joel at Tel Aviv University and her colleagues looked at large data sets about male and female brains. And they concluded that there was of all of the brains and all of the brain scans that they looked at, they did not see one brain that was all male or one brain that was all female. They said that all of our brains are a mixture, a mosaic. And I love that sense of our brains being mosaics because really a mosaic is an awful lot more interesting than a plain pink wall or a plain blue one. Let me tell you uh, another outside of science story, um, giving you a little different views today. Um, this one is from the art world, from an artist named Clara Peters. I'm not going to the room. I have a big unless presentation. You, unless you have a PhD yeah. in art history, I suspect that you don't know who Clara Peters is. Um, and that's okay. She painted at the same time as Rembrandt and you do know who Rembrandt is. Um, up until not very long ago, you could have gotten one of her paintings at, uh, at an auction house for really a comparatively small amount of money, certainly compared to the other uh, artists of the Dutch Golden Age. Then the Prado Museum in Madrid decided to give her a solo show. It was the first solo show actually they had ever done of a woman artist. And all of a sudden, Clara Peters became quite famous. And no, you can't buy one of her paintings anymore. I happened to be in Madrid while I was working on the book and the show was over, but the Prado still has a couple of her pictures 
up way on the second floor, may I say, but they still have a couple of her pictures up. And I went upstairs and I looked at them. And as you can see from this tiny example, they were exquisite. They were just absolutely beautifully breathtaking pieces. And as I looked at them, I had very mixed feelings because first of all, it's so wonderfully exciting for somebody who has been forgotten to be rediscovered, for women who have been paid no attention to, to suddenly be declared a genius by one of the great museums of the world. But the other side of that was the distressing side. Her work has not changed in the last 400 years. If Clara Peters is a genius now, wasn't she always a genius? Why did we not know that? And as I thought about it more and more, I realized that genius does not have a specific definition. I had already done a lot of research and I hope some of you will have a chance to read the book. And, and uh, I had discovered that IQ and all of the other things that we use to measure genius are pretty meaningless. And ultimately who we consider a genius changes over time and in, who, in and how their story gets told. And I also discovered that one of the biggest things that separates men and women in being called genius or not is not their talent, is not their ability, is not even their hard work. It's simply the power to set the rules. Men have had that power and women have not. And so perhaps it's not a surprise that men have always declared people who are like themselves to be the geniuses. And I certainly hope, and I think we are starting to see, starting, that as more and more women do come into power, that maybe our definition and our recognition of who geniuses are will also start to change. That equation of extraordinary talent mixed with celebrity will allow more and more of the women to have the celebrity too. Geniuses by their very definition are unique, <laughs> they're distinctive. That's what makes you a genius, you're a bit of an outlier. But I interviewed so many extraordinary women working right now that I was able to come up with several traits that they have in common. And I'd like to share a few of those with you. Um, the first and perhaps most surprising to me was that virtually all of them had blinders to bias. All of us, all of you are dealing with bias, possibly on a daily basis. Um, you're discovering people treating you differently than perhaps you would have liked. So many of the women that I interviewed just didn't let themselves notice it when they were on the way up. Uh, Joe Dunkley, who I mentioned before, who is the tenured professor of physics at Princeton, said that when she was an undergraduate at Oxford, she never went to the women in science classes because she never thought of herself as a woman in science. She was just a scientist, a physicist. And she was never afraid to raise her hand in class because it never occurred to her that she was the only woman there. Blinders to bias. Now that she's in a position where she can do something about it, she works incredibly hard in mentoring other women, in helping other women. Her comment was that not everybody should have to be like her and have those blinders to bias. And I agree with that. Somebody else who was very similar to her, um, uh, somewhat older, Meg Yuri, uh, who was the first tenured physics professor at Yale. And by the way, it's 2020. I was writing this book a year or two ago and I cannot tell you how many of the people I interviewed were the first in something. Uh, Meg had been a NASA scientist and uh, had been hired away from Yale. She was the head of the Yale's physics department and as I said, the first tenured woman professor at Yale. And Meg is a huge advocate for women in science and one of the great leaders in, in raising the issues. But again, she said that when she was very young, when there was nothing she could do about it, she would look at NASA, at the people at NASA, and she would think, why are none of them women? Why do I have no role models? And then she would think, oh, I know what it must be. It must be that no woman has ever wanted to do what I want to do before. And she told me the story, she laughed and she said, you know, of course, now she knows that's complete baloney. Of course, there've been women who wanted to do it before, but didn't have the chance. But that belief that maybe she was doing something different was what allowed her to have the courage to go on and to do it. And so I think that sense of not noticing, going ahead until you can make changes is an interesting and powerful one. Another uh, trait that I found among the women geniuses was an ability to see beyond gender. By that, I mean, they didn't see themselves as women scientists or male scientists and or whatever their field may have been. 
Um, a great example was uh, Tina Landau, who is a Broadway director, and she's a terrific Broadway director. And one year she was the only woman, as in most years she would have been, the only woman nominated in the directing category, um, uh, the only woman nominated in the directing category, excuse me. And she said she did not like to think of herself as a woman director. She said she is a woman who directs. Now, it seems like it's a very subtle distinction, but it's a really important one. And I think it's really important that we do all think of ourselves that way. A woman who directs means she's happy to be a woman and she loves being a director, but they are true, true and unrelated. It doesn't have anything, how she directs has nothing to do with the fact that she is a woman. When we categorize people together, when we talk about a woman scientist, a woman director, a woman engineer, sometimes we are limiting how we start to think about them. Organizations like this one are very, very important and uh, putting women together in that category is very important for, for so many reasons, but also being able to see beyond that and to see yourself in a broader view, I think also helps. And the third category um, among others that I found was people having a positive approach. Now, the previous book that I wrote uh, was the bestseller, The Gratitude Diaries. So I admit, I look for positivity and gratitude everywhere. But I have to say that I have never seen a group of women who were less complaining um, than the genius women that I interviewed. And one of them who most impressed me was the woman you see here, who's Dr. Frances Arnold. And she did win a Nobel Prize. Uh, she won the Nobel Prize in chemistry just a couple of years ago. Uh, she's at Caltech. And when um, she started doing her research, uh, she did something called directed evolution, which she named it directed evolution, which was a completely new way of creating proteins and enzymes in the lab. And when she started doing that work, all of the men, and they were mostly men in labs around the world, told her that she was nuts and that it was never going to work and that she should stop and do a more traditional method. And I said to her, how did you get the courage to go on when everyone was telling you that it wouldn't work? And she said, I did not doubt myself. Now, frankly, I think you deserve a Nobel Prize just for being able to say, I did not doubt myself. How much more could all of us do if we had that Francis Arnold attitude, if we didn't doubt ourselves? She also said to me that she works really hard to encourage women to face the world in a positive and hopeful way rather than a negative and fearful one. And she said, fear is what holds you back more than anything. And if you're fearful, you're not going to try a new method. You're not going to come up with the revolutionary idea. In her personal life, by the way, she has had enormous tragedies. And she has managed to keep that positivity in her personal life too. Um, a sense of gratitude, a sense of positivity. I think they go really, really far in enabling us to take the talents we have, to take the genius we have, and to take it out into the world without fear and with great courage. One other trait that so many of the women I met had in common was a multifaceted life. Uh, one of the women I interviewed was Sion Bylock, who is the president of Barnard College, and she's also a psychology researcher. And she told me that she thinks it's really important for women to have many different selves. And she didn't mean that in a three faces of Eve kind of way, nobody is recommending schizophrenia, but in the sense of having many different selves that you can turn to, that you are as she is, she sees herself as a mother, a parent, a friend, a psychology researcher, um, a colleague, on and on. So many things that we all are and that it makes it better to be and to, to live that way. Um, so many of the women that I interviewed had children. Um, maybe, it was, uh, maybe it was just the people I happened to choose. They had children of all different ages, depending on how old they happened to be. Um, they all talked about their spouses or their partners, not as being supportive, 
but as being partners, as, as seeing their careers, their spouse's careers as just as important and as splitting childcare and all else uh, completely 50-50. But to go back to Sian Bylock, uh, she told me that some days she sees herself as just a great psychology researcher or a great president who's had these wonderful breakthroughs in her life and that she's such an important person. And other days she sees herself as just a terrible mom who forgot to pack her eight-year-old daughter's lunch. Well, all of us are both of those things. And I think we have great strength in our lives when we allow ourselves to recognize that we can go back and forth, that we can be more than one thing, that being many different parts of, of a person in the same way that men have always been um, allows us to, to have great strength. Now, I'd like to close um, by telling you a story about um, a young woman who you see here, who at the time's name was Jocelyn Bell. Uh, this was back in the 1960s. And Jocelyn Bell was a postgraduate student. And she discovered something that later became known as pulsars. She showed her discovery to her uh, advisor, who was a man, and he told her that no, 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 she didn't understand what she was looking at. It was definitely not what she thought it was. She was wrong. Well, as it happened, she was right. And in a story very much like the Lise Meitner story that I mentioned earlier, she, the, the discovery won the Nobel Prize, but Jocelyn Bell did not win the Nobel Prize. It went to the male advisor who had told her she was wrong. Jocelyn was young at the time, and she was very gracious about uh, the award or lack of award. And she said, you know, I'm just a student and so postgraduate student. And so maybe it's correct that the lab advisor should be the person who wins. Well, many decades went by. Uh, she got a title uh, and uh, uh, some new names and she became Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. You may be familiar with something called the Breakthrough Awards, which were started a few years ago by a group of billionaires in Silicon Valley. And their idea was to recognize great discoveries and great breakthroughs, and to perhaps be a little more diverse and forward-looking than the Nobel Committee had been. Well, they awarded Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell a $3 million breakthrough prize for her discovery all those decades earlier of pulsars. And this time Dame Burnell was again very gracious and she accepted the award. But then she turned around and she said she was going to donate every penny of that $3 million to fighting unconscious bias and to helping advance women in science. How absolutely delicious is that? Um, sometimes we have to wait 50 years to be truly, truly recognized. But then when you get to turn around and thumb your nose at the men in power and tell them it's time for things to change, it's time to truly recognize the genius of women, then we have done something special. And you do realize that things can change. We can have the power. We can let our own genius shine through. Thank you. And uh, I am very happy to, um, to share some, to uh, take some questions. Hi, Janice. Unfortunately, we've, we're going on and we're going to have to move on to our next panel. But um, if you want to connect with Janice, how do they connect with you? Um, you can reach me through my website, which is uh, www.janicekaplan.com. And uh, there is a contact page there. And I would love to hear from you and uh, hear your stories and uh, share ideas.